This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Zuckert. Tales of the Brass Hedgehog. Hedgehog.net. Understood Betsy. By Dorothy Canfield. Chapter 7. Elizabeth Ann Fails in an Examination. I wonder if you can guess the name of a little girl who, about a month after this, was walking along through the melting snow in the woods with a big black dog running in circles around her. Yes, all alone in the woods with a terrible great dog beside her, and yet not a bit afraid. You don't suppose it could be Elizabeth Ann? Well, whoever she was, she had something on her mind, for she walked more and more slowly, and had only a very absent-minded pat for the dog's head when he thrust it up for a caress. When the wood road led into a clearing, in which there was a rough little house of slabs, the child stopped altogether, and looking down, began nervously to draw lines in the snow with her overshoe. You see, something perfectly dreadful had happened in school that day. The superintendent, the all-important, seldom-seen superintendent, came to visit the school, and the children were given some examinations, so he could see how they were getting on. Now, you know what an examination did to Elizabeth Ann. Or haven't I told you yet? Well, if I haven't, it's because words fail me. If there is anything horrid that an examination didn't do to Elizabeth Ann, I've yet to hear of it. It began years ago, before she ever went to school, when she heard Aunt Frances talking about how she had dreaded examinations when she was a child, and how they dried up her mouth and made her ears ring and her head ache and her knees get all weak and her mind a perfect blank so that she didn't know what two and two made. Of course, Elizabeth Ann didn't feel all those things right off at her first examination, but by the time she had had several and had rushed to tell Aunt Frances about how awful they were, and the two of them had sympathized with one another and compared symptoms and then wept about her resulting low marks, why, she not only had all the symptoms Aunt Frances ever had, but a good many more of her own invention. Well, she had them all and had them hard this afternoon when the superintendent was there. Her mouth had gone dry, and her knees had shaken, and her elbows had felt as though they had no more bones in them than so much jelly, and her eyes had smarted, and oh, what answers she made! That dreadful tight panic had clutched at her throat whenever the superintendent had looked at her, and she had disgraced herself ten times over. She went hot and cold to think of it, and felt quite sick with hurt vanity. She who did so well every day, and was so much looked up to by her classmates, what must they be thinking of her? To tell the truth, she had been crying as she walked along through the woods, because she was so sorry for herself. Her eyes were all red still, and her throat sore from the big lump in it. And now she would live it all over again as she told the Putney cousins, for of course they must be told. She had always told Aunt Frances everything that happened in school. It happened that Aunt Abigail had been taking a nap when she got home from school, and so she had come out to the sap house where Cousin Anne and Uncle Henry were making syrup to have it over with as soon as possible. She went up to the little slab house now, dragging her feet and hanging her head, and opened the door. Cousin Anne, in a very short old skirt and a man's coat and high rubber boots, was just poking some more wood into the big fire which blazed furiously under the broad, flat pan where the sap was boiling. The rough brown hut was filled with white steam and that sweetest of all odors, hot maple syrup. Cousin Anne turned her head, her face very red with the heat of the fire, and nodded at the child. "'Hello, Betsy, you're just in time. I've saved out a cupful of hot syrup for you, all ready to wax.' Betsy hardly heard this, although she had been wild about waxed sugar on snow ever since her first taste of it. "'Cousin Anne,' she said unhappily, "'the superintendent visited our school this afternoon.' "'Did he?' said Cousin Anne, dipping a thermometer into the boiling syrup. "'Yes, and we had examinations,' said Betsy. "'Did you?' said Cousin Anne holding the thermometer up to the light and looking at it. "'And you know how perfectly awful examinations make you feel,' said Betsy, very near to tears again. "'Why, no,' said Cousin Anne, sorting over syrup tins. "'They never made me feel awful. I thought they were sort of fun.' "'Fun!' cried Betsy indignantly, staring through the beginnings of her tears. "'Why, yes, like taking a dare, don't you know? Somebody stumps you to jump off the hitching post, and you do it to show them. 
I always used to think examinations were like that. Somebody stumps you to spell pneumonia, and you do it to show them. Here's your cup of syrup. You'd better go right out and wax it while it's hot. Elizabeth Ann automatically took the cup in her hand, but she did not look at it. "'But supposing you get so scared you can't spell pneumonia or anything else,' she said feelingly. "'That's what happened to me. You know how your mouth gets all dry and your knees—' She stopped. Cousin Anne had said she did not know all about those things. "'Well, anyhow, I got so scared I could hardly stand up, and I made the most awful mistakes. Things I know just as well. I spelled doubt without any B and separate with an E, and I said Iowa was bounded on the north by Wisconsin, and I—' "'Oh, well,' said Cousin Anne. It doesn't matter if you really know the right answers, does it? That's the important thing. This was an idea which had never in all her life entered Betsy's brain, and she did not take it in at all now. She only shook her head miserably and went on in a doleful tone, And I said thirteen and eight are doing two, and I wrote March without any capital M, and I— Look here, Betsy, do you want to tell me all this? Cousin Anne spoke in the quick, ringing voice she had once in a while, which made everybody— from old Shep up, open his eyes and get his wits about him. Betsy gathered hers and thought hard, and she came to an unexpected conclusion. No, she didn't really want to tell Cousin Anne all about it. Why was she doing it? Because she thought it, that it was the thing to do. Because if you don't really want to, went on Cousin Anne, I don't see that it's doing anybody any good. I guess Hemlock Mountain will stand right there just the same, even if you did forget to put a B in doubt. "'and your syrup will be too cool to wax right "'if you don't take it out pretty soon.' "'She turned back to stoke the fire, "'and Elizabeth Ann, in a daze, "'found herself walking out of the door. "'It fell shut after her, "'and there she was, under the clear, pale blue sky, "'with the sun just hovering over the rim of Hemlock Mountain. "'She looked up at the big mountains, "'all blue and silver with shadows and snow, "'and wondered what in the world Cousin Anne had meant.' Of course Hemlock Mountain would stand there just the same, but what of it? What did that have to do with her arithmetic, with anything? She had failed in her examination, hadn't she? She found a clean white snowbank under a pine tree, and setting her cup of syrup down in a safe place, began to pat the snow down hard to make the right bed for the waxing of the syrup. The sun, very hot for that late March day, brought out strongly the tarry perfume of the big pine tree. Near her the sap dripped musically into a bucket, already half full, hung on a maple tree. A blue jay rushed suddenly through the upper branches of the wood, his screaming and chattering voice sounding like noisy children at play. Elizabeth Ann took up her cup and poured some of the thick hot syrup out on the hard snow, making loops and curves as she poured. It stiffened and hardened at once, and she lifted up a great coil of it, threw her head back, and let it drop into her mouth concentrated sweetness of summer days was in that mouthful, part of it still hot and aromatic, part of it icy and wet with melting snow. She crunched it all together with her strong child's teeth into a delicious big lump and sucked on it dreamily, her eyes on the rim of Hemlock Mountain, high above her there, the snow on it bright golden in the sunlight. Uncle Henry had promised to take her up to the top as soon as the snow went off. She wondered what the top of a mountain would be like, Uncle Henry had said the main thing was that you could see so much of the world at once. He said it was too queer the way your own house and big barn and great fields looked like little toy things that weren't of any account. It was because you could see so much more than just the— She heard an imploring whine, and a cold nose was thrust into her hand. Why, there was old Shep, begging for his share of wax sugar. He loved it, though it did stick to his teeth so. She poured out another lot and gave half of it to Shep. It immediately stuck his jaws together tight, and he began pawing at his mouth and shaking his head till Betsy had to laugh. Then he managed to pull his jaws apart and chewed loudly and visibly, tossing his head, opening his mouth wide till Betsy could see the sticky brown candy draped in melting festoons all over his big white teeth and red gullet. Then, with a gulp, he had swallowed it all down and was whining for more, striking softly at the little girl's skirt with his forepaw. "'Oh, you eat it too fast!' cried Betsy. But she shared her next lot with him, too. The sun had gone down over Hemlock Mountain by this time, and the big slope above her was all deep blue shadow. The mountain looked much higher now as the dusk began to fall, and loomed up bigger and bigger, as though it reached to the sky. It was no wonder houses looked small from its top. 
Betsy ate the last of her sugar, looking up at the quiet giant there, towering grandly above her. There was no lump in her throat now. And although she still thought she did not know what in the world Cousin Anne meant by saying that about Hemlock Mountain and her examination, it's my opinion that she had made a very good beginning of an understanding. She was just picking up her cup to take it back to the sap house when Shep growled a little and stood with his ears and tail up, looking down the road. Something was coming down that road in the blue, clear twilight, something that was making a very queer noise. It sounded almost like somebody crying. It was somebody crying. It was a child crying. It was a little, little girl. Betsy could see her now, stumbling along and crying as though her heart would break. Why, it was little Molly, her own particular charge at school, whose reading lesson she heard every day. Betsy and Shep ran to meet her. "'What's the matter, Molly? What's the matter?' Betsy knelt down and put her arms around the weeping child. "'Did you fall down? Did you hurt you? What are you doing way off here? Did you lose your way?' "'I don't want to go away! I don't want to go away!' said Molly, over and over, clinging tightly to Betsy. It was a long time before Betsy could quiet her enough to find out what had happened. Then she made out between Molly's sobs that her mother had been taken suddenly sick and had to go away to a hospital, and that left nobody at home to take care of Molly, and she was to be sent away to some strange relatives in the city who didn't want her at all and who said so right out. Oh, Elizabeth Ann knew all about that, and her heart swelled big with sympathy. For a moment she stood again out on the sidewalk in front of the Lathrop house with old Mrs. Lathrop's ungracious white head bobbing from a window and knew again that ghastly feeling of being unwanted. Oh, she knew why little Molly was crying, and she shut her hands together hard and made up her mind that she would help her out. Do you know what she did, right off, without thinking about it? She didn't go and look up Aunt Abigail. She didn't wait until Uncle Henry came back from his round of emptying sap buckets into the big tub on his sled. As fast as her feet could carry her, she flew back to Cousin Anne in the sap house. I can't tell you, except again that Cousin Anne was Cousin Anne, why it was that Betsy ran so fast to her and was so sure that everything would be all right as soon as Cousin Anne knew about it. But whatever the reason was, it was a good one. For, though Cousin Anne did not stop to kiss Molly or even look at her more than one sharp first glance, she said, after a moment's pause, during which she filled a syrup can and screwed the cover down very tight, "'Well, if her folks will let her stay, how would you like to have Molly come and stay with us till her mother gets back from the hospital? Now you've got a room of your own, I guess, if you wanted. You could have her sleep with you.' "'Oh, Molly, Molly, Molly!' shouted Betsy, jumping up and down, then hugging the little girl with all her might. "'Oh, it'll be like having a little sister!' Cousin Anne sounded a dry warning note. "'Don't be too sure her folks will let her. We don't know about them yet.' Betsy ran to her and caught her hand, looking up at her with shining eyes. "'Cousin Anne, if you go to see them and ask them, they will.' This made even Cousin Anne give a little abashed smile of pleasure, although she made her face grave again at once and said— "'You'd better go along back to the house now, Betsy. "'It's time for you to help Mother with the supper.' "'The two children trotted back along the darkening wood road, "'Shep running before them, little Molly clinging fast to the older child's hand. "'Aren't you ever afraid, Betsy, in the woods this way?' "'She asked admiringly, looking about her with timid eyes. "'Oh, no,' said Betsy, protectingly. "'There's nothing to be afraid of, "'except getting off on the wrong fork of the road near the wolf pit.' "'Oh, oh!' said Molly, cringing. "'What's the wolf pit? What an awful name!' Betsy laughed. She tried to make her laugh sound brave, like Cousin Anne's, which always seemed so scornful of being afraid. As a matter of fact, she was beginning to fear that they had made the wrong turn, and she was not quite sure that she could find the way home, but she put this out of her mind and walked along very fast, peering ahead into the dusk. "'Oh, it hasn't anything to do with wolves.' she said in answer to Molly's question. "'Anyhow, not now. It's just a big deep hole in the ground where a brook had dug out a cave. Uncle Henry told me all about it when he showed it to me. And then part of the roof caved in. Sometimes there's ice in the corner of the covered part all the summer, Aunt Abigail says.' "'Why do you call it the wolf pit?' asked Molly, walking very close to Betsy and holding very tightly to her hand. Oh, ever so long ago, when the first settlers came up here, they heard a wolf howling all night, and when it didn't stop in the morning, they came up here on the mountain and found a wolf had fallen in and couldn't get out. My, I hope they killed him, said Molly. Oh, gracious, that was more than a hundred years ago, said Betsy. She was not thinking of what she was saying. 
She was thinking that if they were on the right road, they ought to be home by this time. She was thinking that the right road ran downhill to the house all the way, and that this certainly seemed to be going up a little. She was wondering what had become of Shep. "'Stand here just a minute, Molly,' she said. "'I want—I just want to go ahead a little bit and see—and see—' She darted on around a curve of the road and stood still, her heart sinking. The road turned there and led straight up the mountain. For just a moment the little girl felt a wild impulse to burst out in a shriek for Aunt Frances and to run crazily away, anywhere so long as she was running. But the thought of Molly standing back there, trustfully waiting to be taken care of, shut Betsy's lips together hard before her scream of fright got out. She stood still, thinking, now she mustn't get frightened. All they had to do was walk back along the road till they came to the fork and then make the right turn. But what if they didn't get back to the turn till it was so dark they couldn't see it? Well, she mustn't think of that. She ran back calling, "'Come on, Molly!' in a tone she tried to make as firm as Cousin Anne's. "'I guess we've made the wrong turn after all. We'd better—' But there was no Molly there. In the brief moment Betsy had stood thinking Molly had disappeared. The long, shallowy wood road held not a trace of her. Then Betsy was frightened, and then she did begin to scream at the top of her voice, "'Molly! Molly!' She was beside herself with terror, and started hastily back to hear Molly's voice very faint, apparently coming from the ground under her feet. "'Oh! Oh, Betsy! Get me out! Get me out!' "'Where are you?' shrieked Betsy. "'I don't know!' came Molly's sobbing voice. "'I just moved the least little bit out of the road and slipped on the ice and began to slide, and I couldn't stop myself, and I fell down into a deep hole!' Betsy's head felt as though her hair was standing straight up on end with horror. Molly must have fallen down into the wolf pit. Yes, they were quite near it. She remembered now that big white birch tree stood right at the place where the brook tumbled over the edge and fell into it. Although she was dreadfully afraid of falling in herself, she went cautiously over to this tree, feeling her way with her foot to make sure she did not slip, and peered down into the cavernous gloom below. Yes. There was Molly's little face, just a white speck. The child was crying, sobbing, and holding up her arms to Betsy. "'Are you hurt, Molly?' "'No, I fell into a big snowbank, but I'm all wet and frozen. I want to get out! I want to get out!' Betsy held on to the birch tree. Her head whirled. What should she do? "'Look here, Molly,' she called down. I'm going to run back along to the right road and get back to the house and get Uncle Henry. He'll come with a rope and get you out. At this, Molly's crying rose to a frantic scream. Oh, Betsy, don't leave me here alone. Don't, don't. The wolves will get me. Betsy, don't leave me alone. The child was wild with horror. But I can't get you out myself, screamed back Betsy, crying herself. Her teeth were chattering with the cold. Don't go, don't go came up from the darkness of the pit in a piteous howl. Betsy made a great effort and stopped crying. She sat down on a stone and tried to think, and this is what came into her mind as a guide. What would Cousin Anne do if she were here? She wouldn't cry. She would think of something. Betsy looked around her desperately. The first thing she saw was the big limb of a pine tree, broken off by the wind, which half lay and half slantingly stood up against a tree a little distance above the mouth of the pit. It had been there so long that the needles had all dried and fallen off, and the skeleton of the branch with the broken stubs looked like—yes, it looked like a ladder. That was what Cousin Anne would have done. "'Wait a minute! Wait a minute, Molly!' she called wildly down the pit, warm all over in excitement. "'Now listen. You go off there in a corner where the ground makes a sort of roof. I'm going to throw something down. You can climb up on, maybe.' "'Oh, oh, it'll hit me!' cried poor little Molly, more and more frightened. But she scrambled off under her shelter obediently, while Betsy struggled with the branch. It was so firmly embedded in the snow that at first she could not budge it at all. But after she cleared that away and pried hard with the stick she was using as a lever, she felt it give a little. She bore down with all her might, throwing her weight again and again on her lever, and finally felt the big branch perceptively move. After that it was easier, as its course was downhill over the snow to the mouth of the pit. 
glowing and pushing wet with perspiration, she slowly maneuvered it along to the edge, turned it squarely, gave it a great shove, and leaned over anxiously. Then she gave a great sigh of relief. Just as she had hoped, it went down sharp end first, and stuck fast in the snow which had saved Molly from broken bones. She was so out of breath with her work that for a moment she could not speak. Then— "'Molly, there! Now I guess you can climb up to where I can reach you!' Molly made a rush for any way out of her prison, and climbed, like the little practiced squirrel that she was, up from one stub to another to the top of the branch. She was still below the edge of the pit there, but Betsy lay flat down on the snow and held out her hands. Molly took hold hard, and, digging her toes into the snow, slowly wormed her way up to the surface of the ground. It was then— at that very moment that Shep came bounding up to them, barking loudly, and after him Cousin Anne striding along in her rubber boots with a lantern in her hand and a rather anxious look on her face. She stopped short and looked at the two little girls, covered with snow, their faces flaming with excitement, and at the black hole gaping behind them. "'I always told Father we ought to put a fence around that pit,' she said in a matter-of-fact voice. "'Some day a sheep's going to fall down there.' "'Shep came along to the house without you, "'and we thought most likely you'd taken the wrong turn.' "'Betsy felt terribly aggrieved. "'She wanted to be petted and praised for her heroism. "'She wanted Cousin Anne to realize. "'Oh, if Aunt Frances were only there, she would realize. "'I fell down in the hole, "'and Betsy wanted to go and get Mr. Putney, "'but I wouldn't let her, "'and so she threw down a big branch and I climbed out,' "'explained Molly, who, now that her danger was past, took Betsy's action quite as a matter of course. "'Oh, that was how it happened,' said Cousin Anne. She looked down the hole and saw the big branch, and looked back and saw the long trail of crushed snow where Betsy had dragged it. "'Well, now, that was quite a good idea for a little girl to have,' she said briefly. "'I guess she'll do to take care of Molly all right.' She spoke in her usual voice, and immediately drew the children after her, but Betsy's heart was singing joyfully as she trotted along, clasping Cousin Anne's strong hand. Now she knew that Cousin Anne realized. She trotted fast, smiling to herself in the darkness. "'What made you think of doing that?' asked Cousin Anne presently, as they approached the house. "'Why, I tried to think what you would have done if you'd been there,' said Betsy. "'Oh,' said Cousin Anne. "'Well,' She didn't say another word, but Betsy, glancing up into her face as they stepped into the lighted room, saw an expression that made her give a little skip and hop of joy. She had pleased Cousin Anne. That night, as she lay in her bed, her arm over Molly cuddled up warm beside her, she remembered, oh, ever so faintly, as something of no importance— that she had failed an examination that afternoon. End of chapter 7